All right, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to get started now. Uh, my name is Steven Spatz. I'm a librarian here at Falvey. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this event, uh, our graphic novel panel. Uh, this is a very exciting topic. I think there's a lot of interest in this topic right now. Uh, our collection here in the library itself is, is growing. And uh, we've got uh, some distinguished guests today I'd like to introduce. And uh, we'll have some questions and comments at the end uh, from you after we go through our regular program. First over here we have Mary Beth Simmons. Uh, Mary Beth has her MFA from the Nonfiction Writing Program at the University of Iowa and is the director of the Writing Center here at Villanova for 10 years. Uh, she's been teaching a graphic memoir for the past three years in her advanced expository writing class. Uh, to my right here is Brian Lynch. He's a second year student in the Graduate Studies in Communication program here at Villanova with an emphasis on media and culture. His short comic, Fury, is featured in the upcoming Layer Zero Survival Anthology. And we've got a copy of it right over on the table over there. <laughs> copy on the table, you can't copy it. Oh, and we have a copy of it on the table over there, along with a couple of other very, very cool books. Okay. Uh, that's put out yearly by Insomnia Publications. He's currently working on a three-issue miniseries, heavily influenced by Miguel Cervantes, Hunter S. Thompson, and Grant Morrison. When he's not busy writing or reading for class, it's a safe bet he can be found at Showcase Comics in Bryn Mawr. the sad truth. <laughs> Uh, over here we have Matt Phelan. He's the illustrator of 15 books, including The Higher Power of Lucky, which was awarded the 2007 Newbery Medal. The Storm in the Barn is his first graphic novel and his first book as both writer and illustrator. And we have that in our collection at the library here, and it might be on the table. And uh, to my left is Jonathan Mayberry. Uh, Jonathan is a multiple Bram Stoker award-winning author, magazine feature writer, playwright, content creator, and writing teacher. His many fiction and non-fiction publications over the last several years include the novels Ghost Road Blues, Bad Moon Rising, and Patient Zero, and the non-fiction works Vampire Universe, The Cryptopedia, which was the 2007 winner of the Bram Stoker Award for Outstanding Achievement in Non-Fiction, and the multiple award-winning Zombie CSU, The Forensics of the Living Dead. <laughs> Jonathan also, also writes the Black Panther comic for Marvel, as well as a variety of projects involving Wolverine, Spider-Man, The Punisher, and other heroes. And a complete list of his works can be found at jonathanmayberry.com. All right, I, uh, we're going to begin uh, by, I'm going to give the panelists each a chance to uh, give a quick story or anecdote about their experiences working in this genre. And, uh, why don't we start with you, um, My book is called The Storm of the Barn, and it's a um, historical fiction, um, supernatural thriller about the Dust Bowl, uh, a kid in the Dust Bowl. And uh, I've been a children's book illustrator for about five years, uh, and I came up with this idea, and originally I thought it would be a novel that I would illustrate, you know, full-page illustration every chapter or something like that, which I've been doing a lot of. Uh, when I sat down and started to write it, I wrote like um, three of the worst pages of prose you probably would ever read, but I won't let you read it, did you? Uh, and in, in those three pages, I was, uh, I was trying to just start the story out, and I realized that I thought to myself, man, I can just draw all this information, like three pictures, I can get all what I'm trying to say across, because I'm an illustrator, and I think visually. And once I realized that, I realized that I should do it as a graphic novel. Uh, and that sort of fell into place. It's originally, my original inspiration is uh, the WPA photography of the 1930s, Dorothea Lange, Walker Evans, those people, uh, which I saw when I was a kid, actually, when I had a big book of uh, these photographs. And they're just amazing. You can't really shake them once you start looking at these photographs of, hey, the, what the Dust Bowl look like and how strange and and just bizarre it was, and then the faces of the farmers and people trying to survive there. Uh, so that's what kind of haunted me, and I, over the years I've just been interested in dust ball and reading a lot of books, just not knowing that I was going to do anything with it, but kind of thought in the back of my head, gee, I'd like to do a story set in dust ball. Um, one day I was at work, and I had a job, and I was uh, doodling during a meeting, which was my want. Um, I had trouble with my boss doing that once. <laughs> had to explain that that's how I think best. And, uh, anyway, uh, I was doodling this uh, person, and I just came up with this uh, 
figure that looked like he had a thunderstorm for a face. And uh, just not thinking about it, I just drew it. And then, it, you know, I kind of st I kept looking at it and thinking, well, that's kind of interesting. And then I tried to think of what kind of story would have this character in it. And then I kind of connected with the Dust Bowl, which I've been thinking about for all these years. And it kind of fell into place like that. Um, so it was written as a standalone novel. Uh, there isn't any chapter breaks. It wasn't done as single issues collected, like a lot of some graphic novels are, you know, were issued first as comic books. This was written to be read as a novel and, and published that way. Uh, it's my first, and um, and I uh, fell in love with the medium when I was working on it. So I mean, hopefully it'll be, uh, there will be more graphic novels coming. That's how I keep them. <coughs> Brian? Okay. Well, I was born in 68, which was a long, long, long time ago, uh, back when comics were 12 cents a piece. <clears throat> and um, I loved comics at the time. I was uh, an avid reader as a kid, and this was great because it was, it was like a movie in your hands. You know, you had the visuals, you had the story, a lot of taste, a lot of action, a lot of high concept. And uh, in the Fantastic Four, they introduced a character called Black Panther. I was introduced in, in a couple of years before I started reading he was the first black superhero ever, and he was also the king of an African nation. He was you know, a really great character. A couple of years into reading Fantastic Four, issues uh, 119, uh, they did a story about apartheid. Now, I grew up in a, in a section of Kensington that was an extremely racist neighborhood, a very strong white neighborhood where you know they, racial intolerance was taken to a, an incredible degree. And words like apartheid were never bandied about. And here I am reading a comic book in 1971, and you know, the thing and the torch go to, go to a country that is essentially South Africa to help break the Black Panther out of, out of jail because he, he was arrested simply for being in the wrong part of town and being black. And I, you know, this was literally mind-blowing for me, like, wait, wait, you mean this really goes on? Um, and I started asking questions, not of the people in my immediate surroundings because I wouldn't have gotten the right answer. Started talking to some teachers, and um, 
they put me in touch with other people, and I found out that there was, hey, there's a whole world out there of people of different races, different uh, cultures. It, it, it sounds weird to have been that isolated from diversity, but in the 60s and early 70s in Philadelphia, it was very common to be that isolated. You know, we didn't have the internet. Uh, there weren't a lot of black actors on television at the time. It was a really isolated world, and we were, you know, my, my family, unfortunately, were, were, were very racist, and they, they kept their kids from this. So they, they, they did not want the, their kids to see um, anyone of other races who were doing anything of interest, anything, anything uh, powerful. And comic books gave that to me, you know, actually opened my eyes and, and made me want to explore, and then I did. Uh, and it's kind of weird because earlier this year, um, or actually late last year, Marvel Comics called me up and asked if I'd like to write for them. Uh, I write novels, and one of my novels had gotten to an editor there, and, and he called me up and asked if I'd like to write for them. And after doing a couple of one-shots, the editor, just out of the blue, not knowing my background with you know, the Black Panther co character, said, hey, there, there's a, a possibility of, of um, the Black Panther magazine opening up. We need a new writer. Would you be interested? It was one of the two stupidest questions I've ever been asked. The first being, do you want to write for Marvel? <laughs> and the second, do I want, want to write Black Panther? And uh, he said, you know, do, do you know the character? So I, uh, the, then of course, the second I get on the book, they switch the character from T'Challa, who was, you know, the, the, the guy who's always been the Black Panther, to his sister Shuri. So now I'm writing a black female character. Um, <laughs> And I have a blast with this. You know, I'm, I'm in my, my fourth issue just came out today. Um, I like writing the book. Yep, it just came out today. It's good. And uh, I turned it into a very political comic, and I'm, I'm having a blast writing it. And that it's kind of a weird pathway to, to comics, but it's it's so oddly appropriate that I wound up on this book. And I also found it today that after uh, I have a series coming up soon called Doom War, which is a mini-series where the character's being pulled out and then they're, we're doing a special thing with it. And I found out that, that the Black Paper comic will continue in continuity after that. So I'll be back writing it after that, that's over. So I'm very happy. Wow. <laughs> Those of you who know me know that I can go on and on and on, so I'm going to stick to a script. <clears throat> I want to first thank Laura Huddlemeyer and, and Judy Olson for asking me to be part of this really cool my mother was a high school librarian for 36 years. I mention this because one of her mantras has always been, reading should be fun. So if I had been a good kid, I could pick out a comic book when we did our Friday afternoon grocery shopping. First ones I remember were 15 cents, so. <laughs> yes, I'm old, we know. We know. <laughs> the difference between 15 and 12 is not that much. <clears throat> Anything Archie or Veronica or Betty was for me. Archie looked like Craig Duncan, a boy in my class. And Veronica looked like Tammy Rodden. And Betty was Carol Thomas, two girls in my class. The fictional Riverdale, where they all lived and went to school, reminded me of my small Midwestern town of Clinton, Illinois. What now sometimes fills me with dread when I hear it, I could relate to these comic book characters. Look at them going for a burger and milkshake with Jughead. How fun. Oh, look, Betty was walking a dog and a skunk sprayed the pooch. Oh, no, how to get the stink out. A tomato juice bath. Note to my 10-year-old self, if my Cocker Spaniel ever has a skunk spray him, remember the tomato juice. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're all following the recent Archie series. <laughs> but after 60 years, Archie proposed to the wealthy Veronica, and this reader is not happy. <laughs> Issue two, think Mary. Issue three in the six issue arc sees the arrival of darling twins named Little Archie and Little Veronica. The issue four teaser. Archie proposes to Betty. What is going on in Riverdale? <laughs> we'll find out the week of December 7th, 2009. Is it possible that Archie's a polygamist? 
Is he Mormon? Yeah. Is he Mormon? <laughs> We're going to find out. I'll be the first in line. <laughs> so my love of comic books, I didn't even get to my 1976 obsession with all things Captain America. Well, this love of comic books naturally progressed into an admiration and appreciation for the graphic novel. Though in my teaching, I include a graphic memoir in a nonfiction writing class. I just want to briefly talk about a couple of graphic memoirs that I've taught here at Villanova. I first taught uh, Mouse in uh, Spiegelman's Mouse in 1993 when I was a graduate instructor at, at Iowa. And I was so psyched because they gave graduate instructors a list of like 15 approved books and Mouse was on there and I thought whoever put this list together is a genius. So I've been, a, I've been teaching uh, the graphic novel or memoir since then. One that I teach here is Chris Ware's Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Boy on Earth. Uh, the other is Alison Bechtel's Fun Home. Uh, both of these books took the authors seven years to create. A uh, reader need only study an intricately drawn panel or two to understand why the creation of these books took so long. Both books are autobiographical, and both books, quite honestly, are pretty depressing. So the notion of the comic is quickly dispelled. Readers are introduced to dysfunctional families, absent or tormented fathers, and the narrator struggles with identity. It sounds pretty literary, doesn't it? And students still wrestle with the text the way they would a non-graphic novel. We discuss plot, narrative, character development, setting, and literary allusions. In Fun Home, for example, Bechtel's use of literary allusions includes Greek mythology, Ken Moo, Fitzgerald, Henry James, Oscar Wilde, just to name a few. And there are two layers of analysis at, at work for the students and for any reader, dissecting the text and unpacking the images. I find that panels such as these always return to the topic of whether or not the study of graphic novels or graphic memoirs is a legitimate scholarly activity. We need only consider the subtitle of today's panel presentation, The Question Glorified Comic Book. I look forward to hearing my fellow panelists and the students' thoughts on this very matter because I am a big believer in teaching uh, and studying the graphic novel and graphic memoir. And I also um, am a very uh, humble participant on this panel and kind of sitting here like the, uh, the geeky fan. So. <laughs> Let's have some fun. Yeah. All right, well, Mary Beth touched on our first topic of conversation, which is uh, uh, what, what the difference is between the term graphic novel and comic. And I'm, I'm wondering if either of you have anything to, to say in, in terms of the difference between graphic novels and comics. Well, that's, that's one of the big, um, I don't know if it's a debate, but it's something that always comes up. And the subset of that is like, what do you call a graphic novel? Is it sequential art? Is it a graphic novel? Because graphic novel, when you think about it, sounds like porn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, none of it, and comics are not necessarily funny, so none of them quite work. Um, and I, it seems to me that a lot of the creators kind of like are sitting back and letting somebody else figure it out. Uh, except for the Art Spiegel, he's yeah. very much into calling comics or funny pictures. I don't know what he's calling them nowadays. Um, it's, you know, loosely, um, a graphic novel can be kind of like my book, which was written as a novel, uh, or it can be a collection of single issues, like Watchmen was originally 12 issues, and then they bound together and it's a graphic novel. Mouse was also um, put out over the years in uh, Raw, I think it is. Was, you know, so it wasn't written in one, it wasn't the uh, creator didn't go away, write it, and then show up to his publisher and say, here's my completed work. It was put out over 10 years, uh, in the case of Mass, I think. Um, they're both, you know, it's, it's a question of, sometimes it's a question of marketing. It's like they don't know what to call them, so they're calling them graphic novels. And graphic novels, some people think, it sounds more literary, something we can, um, you know, discuss in the university. Um, but it's, it's all the same thing. It's, you know, um, Will Eisner called it sequential storytelling, um, sequential art. It's uh, telling a story where the words and the pictures are doing the storytelling. Um, so I personally don't really care what you call them. <laughs> um, but it, there are these different uh, versions that we have to call them something. So, so far, a graphic novel is what they're settled on. Um, but 
I, you know, I keep waiting for somebody to come up with something better, and everyone will say, yeah, that's great. Uh, but until then, I'll just not call them anything. Just sort of make them. I was going to say much the same thing. Um, I think the term graphic novel, you know, I just looked up at Wikipedia out of curiosity. You know, it comes from our speaking, not our speaking, uh, Will Eisner's first book, Contract with God, which, yeah, I think he wrote shortly while he was doing Spirit. And he just decided, you know, to try and sell it to somebody as a book. And so they said, oh, is this one of those comic books? And they said, no, it's a graphic novel. It's, you know, he just wants to say, don't say comic book, don't say comic book, don't say comic book. And they kind of latched onto this as a different way of, you know, like a selling a differentiating in between, you know, comic book. And, you know, you're, granted, you're going to have people say, oh, well, graphic novels are more mature, they handle different material. And granted, they do. But, you know, you're starting to see more, like, a blurring of lines between that and, you know, mainstream comic books. I mean, if you read, like, you know, Sandman and Preacher and things like that, and they will deal with the exact same kind of very incredibly heavy stuff that you see in graphic novels. <coughs> and yet, at the same time, you know, they are doing the same kind of do because they're comics. You know, they're not, you know, graphic novels. And still, people will maintain, oh, well, you know. I was watching an interview with Neil Gaiman um, a couple weeks back, and somebody came up to him, apparently, and said, oh, you're the man who writes that Sandman series. He's like, yes, yes, I'm Neil Gaiman and I write comic books. I don't. I write graphic novels. As if there's, you know, like Matt said, there's some kind of, you know, tangible difference between the two of them. I don't really think there is. You know, I think, you know, this is kind of a construct that we come up with just in terms of sales, and we really should try to ignore that. And, you know, if we're serious about this comic thing, you know, blur the lines, you know, find ways to, you know, cross between the two, and for the most part, just with great art. Yeah, the, the rush to give something a label um, is usually a marketing decision. Um, sometimes it's some, the first person who comes up with the title for it, um, they throw that title out, and the label out, and that's what it's called. And right now, graphic novels, that's the marketing name, and we're, we're going to have that name. I, it, even if somebody comes up with one that is more appropriate to its content, we're not going to change it. We're invested in that phrase, graphic novels. It's, it's, it's what they call the shelves in the bookstores. And once it gets on the names, uh, on the shelves of the bookstores, you're not going to budget. Um, they, they tried, like, it, they, they, they've played with, with different genre things over the years. Uh, for a while, when they were trying to decide what to call writers like Thomas Harris and um, Robert Ludlum, they used suspense, they used spy, they, you know, and then they, they found the word thriller worked. And now there's a thriller bookshelf in most bookstores. And thriller is what's going to be called from now on. Um, they, you know, it, it's a label that that everyone can be comfortable with, even if it's not precise. And most labels are not precise when they're down to the degree. Now, one thing that it, that you mentioned, you touched on that, that I, I do agree with. There is a a development of a of a um, a difference in some people's mindset between what a comic book is and what a graphic novel is, in that there's a kind of a snobbishness going on where. They want to separate graphic novels out from comics as if comics have no value. And that, that's an argument they're always going to lose because we can point to comic books, even the issue comic books, not the, the collections, that spoke to profound issues. And uh, as, as mentioned, Mouse was serialized originally. Uh, most of the great comics, most of the great graphic novels that we can point to were comics first. Just because it's in you know, a magazine form um, for whatever they're selling for nowadays, two ninety nine, doesn't mean that it has no value. It's it's, it's similar to the, uh, to the prejudice against genre fiction, saying that if it's a mystery, a horror, or or a thriller, that it's not of the same literary merit as something that is published under literary fiction, and that's garbage. Look at James Lee Burke. Look, you know, I, that's literary fiction. He just simply li simply likes to call himself crime novels. We shouldn't spend a, a lot of time getting hung up on the label. Uh, it's nice that that label can encompass such an incredible range of material, from Archie's peccadillos to um, Art Spiegelman's you know, exploration of the horrors of the Holocaust. It's all all one world, and I'm I'm actually comfortable with the graphic novel label. All right, next let's uh, move on to talking about the writing experience itself, and uh, specifically how. Uh, 
does graphic novel writing differ from the novel writing experience? Um, who would like to start? Mark's papers. <laughs> Um, like I said before, I started originally started writing my book as a prose novel, and it wasn't um, I wasn't able to be as precise as I wanted to be, and I also uh, wanted to be able to use silence a lot in my book um, to just be able to show the characters and try to tell the story through silence, and um, so it led me to the graphic novel thing. Uh, I had never written a graphic novel before. <laughs> um, so I even I sold this one, but still I haven't haven't actually written one before. Uh, but I had written screenplays. So what I did was sort of take the screenplay model. If you ever seen a format for a screenplay, uh, and sort of adapted it um, to my needs for two reasons. One was because I was working with an editor and a publisher, uh, and I wanted to be able to give her the story in a way that made sense to her and was. Um, something she could actually read, and she, you know, because she was new to comics too, uh, that we could all get behind. And um, there's a lot of different ways. It's kind of like great comics. There's a lot of different ways. Everyone seems to have a different way of writing them. Uh, but for screenplays, the the model that I liked was um, William Goldman's Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, hmm. which is um, they print out the whole script in uh, his book Adventures in the Screen Trade. I think it's called. Uh, but he wrote in a really um, reader-friendly way. It's not like close-up, medium shot, pullback, all that junk that a lot of people put screenplays is not there. It's very much just telling you what you see. So it's really fun to read and you can not get caught up in the technical stuff. Uh, so I kind of adapted that for my own purposes and what I basically did is I described every panel that's in the book and I would put in dialogue when dialogue was needed. Uh, but basically each little bit was me describing the picture, um, you know, Jack opens the door, you know, in, from the inside we see him, blah, 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 you know, it just went that way. Uh, because I was seeing the story in my head, and then just sort of describing what I saw in my head. And that really um, worked well uh, for me. Uh, after I was finished that, then I did little sketches of everything I had written to make sure it worked as a, as a book. Um, so there's different levels, stages, before I actually started drawing the book. Uh, but I wanted to make sure it worked on paper first. Um, I'm very, uh, uh, movies are a big influence uh, on my work, and uh, Hitchcock was a big guy, big guy, was a big guy, but he was, uh, <laughs> his way of working was to get everything on the script, everything down in the script, so when he got to the floor to shoot it, he knew what he was doing, he wasn't one of these guys that sort of like, well, let's put the camera over here and let's try it five times, and he, you know, he went in and shot what he knew was going to be there, the Coen brothers worked the same way. Uh, and to me, that seemed like a, uh, a good way to go about it, because I heard from other people, uh, other illustrators who had written, written their own stories, and got in there and just started drawing, you know, finished pages, and worked the story as they drew. Uh, a lot of people do that. But I've also heard nightmares where they get like 200 pages in and say, ah, oh, you know, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like I threw out 75 pages of illustrations, and I just was not going to go down that path, so I wanted to write it out. Um, so, I mean, I have not written a novel either, uh, but I've tried, and it's difficult. Uh, the only thing I can say is, from my point of view, is in the script uh, that preceded The Storm in the Barn, it was me describing the pictures, um, rather than having to put it in the connective tissue that a novel writer has to put in uh, to get you from paragraph to paragraph, and the adjectives, and the you know, what the character's thinking. I could just be very precise, and this is what you see. I couldn't put in uh, and Jack was thinking this. No, it's, it's a visual thing, so I was writing, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what they said. Uh, where in a novel, you can kind of, uh, you can add to it uh, from reading experiences, which is what makes novels fantastic um, as a different medium. Uh, so those are the difference I, I found writing this. Uh, writing, thinking that it's going to be visual uh, and keeping in mind the particular medium that you're working in, which is comics. Uh, Jonathan, I know that you did a lot of writing before, a lot, a lot of, uh, before you got into the, the visual medium. I wonder, um, Matt talked about uh, a format looking like a script or a screenplay. Is that, when you produce something for Marvel, is that, what is what does your document end up looking like? It, it's a script. Um, and it's very, very much like a movie script, probably more like a television script. Uh, but 
the writer decides what goes in each panel in terms of, of what visuals he wants to tell um, the visual component of his story, and he also writes the script, the actual uh, the dialogue, captions if there are any captions. Uh, so it uh, is actually a full script. Like film, though, the writer has to trust that the the artist is going to bring their A game to it and tell a component of the story through their visuals. Um, there are some writers who are um, very, uh, very much control freaks, and they want everything their way, and they may not necessarily be artists, or may not be visual thinkers. Uh, they, they may be good storytellers, and as a result, they, they either are constantly at a struggle, in a struggle with the artists, or their work comes out looking uh, and reading stilted. Uh, in the short time I've been with Marvel, I've, I've worked with several different artists and noticed a lot of different visual styles. I have uh, only rarely had a, 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 a pencils come uh, be sent to me by the editor and then not be exactly what I want. Uh, usually the artist will add things to it to, to enrich uh, the, art, uh, the storytelling, the visual storytelling, and often it's, it's, it's something that they as an artist see, that, that me as a writer, uh, uh, that I as a writer do not see. And that, that's a nice happy union. Sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll do a panel and it's just not right. And you, you tell the editor and they'll tell the artist and they make a change. But more often than not, these guys you know, are very comfortable in their strength. Their, their game is visual storytelling. It's a nice happy medium. In, in writing novels, it's, it's completely different. Um, you, know, you, you do have all that connective tissue. But there, there's been a change in novel writing uh, formats for the last couple of years. Novels have shifted to you to use sh uh, shorter chapters, a lot of chapters, and they're shorter. So it's much more like the visual beats in, in the panels of, of comics, uh, where you don't have to write as much of the linking material. You get to the point of the scene, get the scene, bang, you're done, leaving with a little narrative hook that makes them want to turn to the next page or next chapter. And that, because that's the style I write my novels in, the transition of writing comics was, was fairly comfortable. Um, I find the two work together. I, I do have the problem of, uh, and I'm, I'm solving it now because I'm, I'm doing this uh, a bit more, but uh, in my first couple of comics they were extremely wordy, and my editor had to remind me I'm not writing novels, I'm writing comics. Um, and that's the point at which you start trust, you having to trust the artist, because what you don't say, you have to leave, you have to put in a note so the artist will show. And it, it really, really does work nicely as, 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 as a combination of uh, Brian, you're you're making a similar transition from yeah straight prose writing to uh, to the visual medium. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, um, I found that um, you know just the difference between writing a, you know writing a novel and writing the comics for me just be you know like the length of having to plan everything out. You know, I tried to write something over the summer. And it was you know one of those big, expensive, three hundred something page novels and. It just really wasn't working out for me, you know. I, you know, I got halfway through it, I got discouraged, got everything, and I just didn't feel like, you know, either I was at the right point or I didn't have the capabilities or anything like that it doesn't matter that I could really handle something like that because I, I go through the first couple of chapters, then I rewrite it because, you know, for me it looked like crap, and then, you know, I kind of keep pressing on. Then I realized, you know, I hadn't outlined everything. I tried to follow an outline, and. I'm the kind of person who likes to have you know an idea of everything that I want to do with a particular story in mind, and just go full force. And if you know, something you know, interesting comes up, I'll go for it. So for me, in writing comics, like with um, you know, the Fury thing, I tried a very kind of rigid approach. I wanted you know the whole thing to convey a particular kind of emotion, a kind of fear, and ending dread. And you know, I think I captured that within those nine pages, but. For you know the project that I'm working on now, I try to go for a bit more of like a cohesive storytelling thing, and you know just one plot to drive along rather than kind of like a particular feeling. In terms of writing with you know an artist in mind, that one you know the period one was just very deliberate. I said you know I'll have eight panels on tape. This is how I want to lay out. I want you know two panels on this side, two panels on this side, two panels on this side. This is what's going to happen in this picture. This is what's going to happen in this picture. This is an example of this particular type of architecture. I, I went so meticulous on that. It is ridiculous. And you can see the result on the other side. It's, you know, it came out incredibly well. That's because I was working with a very talented artist who um, willingly went back. We asked my demands. 
with, um, you know, for what I'm working on right now, I decided that um, visual parts of it were just more important. Whereas I figured I had gotten kind of like the, the truncated text element of comics kind of down the hat. And then, you know, comics are very, as Jonathan said, very primarily visual format. And you want to allow the text to complement it rather than to interrupt it. You know, you have to play with that. You have to uh, you know, be aware of that as a storyteller and just compress everything. You know, whenever you're writing something, you want to tell the same thing in as few words as possible. I've heard, you know, some people say that you should have a maximum of, say, 50 words in a particular panel, you know, regardless of size. You know, if it's a you know, one-page panel, 50 words. If it's, you know, you know, six panels in a page, each one maximum of 50 words, whatever. But for this one, I decided, you know, I'll try putting more of it in the hands of the artist. I want to trust in their perspective. I want to trust in what they're doing. And oddly enough, I got some critique back from you know a friend of mine who's an artist, and he said, you know, I, I really like your script. I really think it's fascinating. I think it's hilarious, but um, you don't seem to have much direction in it. You don't seem to tell me what to write. I'm like, that's because I want you to you know figure that part out. Oh, I know, but it, it would have been really nice if you just had this kind of like shot like this, shot like that. Like, okay. You know, so that's something I have to keep in mind. You know, that particular balance between what I want and what the artist wants. And while I'd be more comfortable, you know, with saying this is what I want, this is the you know particular type of emotion I want the characters to be having. This is what I want them to be saying. This is how I want them to be coming across. And you can take care of the rest of it. And you know, do it away, be a little hearts content. Apparently, they want a little bit more than that. So. Uh, Greg Bryan has, has uh, touched on <clears throat> the subject of collaboration, and uh, of the three of you, um, you're all coming from slightly different perspectives, Matt, uh, more traditionally been an illustrator, and uh, Jonathan, uh, working at an established company with, with many uh, established illustrators, and Brian, uh, working more on an independent level, and finding uh, collaborators who... Yeah who are in the same kind of situation as you. Um, would the three of you like to touch more on, on your uh, relationship with collaborators? Um, um, so I work primarily in the children's book industry. I've done um, picture books, uh, chapter books, early readers, stuff like that, and even some stuff for teens. Um, and one of the great uh, things about um, children's books in, as an industry is they put a lot of trust in the illustrator. So, um, like I said, the story of the blind is the first thing I wrote. So, uh, all the other books I worked on were, were written by someone else. Uh, and the first, what I get from the publisher is just the manuscript on, you know, it's typed out. And, you know, a picture book that can be just like a, a single page because there's not that many words. Uh, and there's nothing. There's no notes. There's no, this is what we think it should be. We, we think this person should be, uh, you know, whatever. You know, they sometimes they don't even know if you're going to be a boy or a girl or a bear or whatever you want to do. Uh, so that first pass is always mine as an illustrator, uh, which is great. And um, it's how I like to work. I think uh, for the writers, it's, um, like Jonathan was saying, it's a little bit you have to sort of let go and trust a little bit of the illustrator. Um, and in children's books, they also don't have the illustrator and the author talking at all. There's no real communication. There's, it's filtered through an editor and an art director. And the reason they do that is because they want the illustrator to bring, like I said, a, your A game. It's like that's, you're being hired to do what you do. Uh, so the first pass at anything that I've illustrated is entirely up to me. And then it's, once that's on the table, it's like having a draft. Then everyone kind of backs and forth and said, you know, is this working? Can we do this? Can we add that? And it's a real work, work, uh, workshop process type thing. Um, but uh, you're always given the chance to add something uh, to what the writer said. Again, what Jonathan is saying, you know, you might find something in the manuscript that the writer wasn't even quite aware of, and hopefully you can bring that in to just um, give each scene a little bit more, a little, a little something extra that it wasn't there before. Uh, so that's the way I work. And when Brian was saying, uh, I mean, I guess there are illustrators who would like more direction. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want that at all unless, you know, something is very specific to the story that I needed to know about. Uh, now I've done research and things like that uh, that authors have helped me out with. 
if they needed like a specific setting, uh, like the higher power of Lucky was set in the California desert, and the author knows the area really well, so she sent me uh, this package of photographs, you know, that I used as my research, uh, which saved me a trip to the California desert, and uh, it was just very helpful because I knew exactly what she was doing. Now she didn't tell me how to draw it or anything like that, so everything kind of gets filtered through how you draw it, but um, you know, I've given that freedom. So that's the way it works uh, in children's books anyway, which is how I've approached it. Now, my publisher is also children's book publishers, now interested in doing graphic novels for young readers. So uh, the transition is the same. You know, I'm working with the same people that I was working before. So uh, they never uh, say, we want you to draw it this way or that way. It's, uh, let's see what you, what you have. Yeah, the uh, collaborations in, in comics are, uh, um, they, they take a couple of different forms. The editor is a, is a participant in this collaborative process uh, almost all the time. Uh, I work with mostly with Axel Alonso, executive editor of Marvel, and he's you know he's been in comics for a long, long time, and he knows what sells in terms of, of the combination of, of written and and uh, illustrated storytelling. So he'll often make uh, some subtle changes in the script. He discusses them with the, with the writer. Uh, sometimes we, we have long discussions on how a story should, should unfold. Um, and then he works with the artist to make sure the artist is capturing the moment as much as possible. Sometimes in order for the artist to, to tell, to, to, to uh, do the picture that the writer has, has uh, suggested, it means rewriting a page because there may not be enough space. Let's say you've written a six panel page, there may not be enough art space for the artist to get across the point. So you may have to restructure the page, make it a four panel, you know, to allow the art to tell more of the story. And those types of back and forths are a nice schooling process. It helps you refine your thinking, simplify your thinking, and get to the heart of what the story is, the message is, for each panel and each page. Um, so I, the process is, is, um, is a, kind of a three-way collaboration. Also, each of the artists I've worked with has had a different style. I've, I've worked with, and I, I haven't met any of the artists. Uh, one's in Bulgaria, one's in Brazil, one's in Scotland, one's in California. Um, thank God for Facebook. You know, we, we use Facebook all the time to communicate. Any creative decisions in terms of changes has to go through the editor. Uh, we can discuss things back and forth in general, but if there, if I want the artist to do something different, or if he, he uh, wants to suggest a significant change, it has to be filtered through the editor because it is, at the end of the day, it's their, their product. We're working in their world. You know. um, there are two other types of collaborations I'm involved in, though. Uh, one is a screenwriter and novelist collaboration. I, I was asked uh, by Universal Pictures to novelize a screenplay, uh, The Wolfman, which is coming out next year. Amicia Del Toro and Anthony Hopkins, Emily Blunt remade The Wolfman, and they did, there was never a book, so they, they asked me if I would novelize the script. This is without seeing the movie. It's you know, working entirely from the script. So I'm, I'm, it's a reverse engineering process. I'm building a new visual sense. And of course, when, when, by the time I finished the book, they had finished cutting the movie, and I, you know, they sent me some changes that, would, uh, that I had to do to make the, the book again fit the, the, the final cut of the film. Um, but it was a fascinating process, because I'm, I'm getting, you know, I had to climb inside the of the screenwriters, and what I know of the actors and how they might interpret the lines. You know, because you know, it isn't enough just to have the line of dialogue in the novel, you actually have to have the emotion the, uh, and everything else that builds that scene. The third collaboration I'm, I'm just about to start is my first actual graphic novel as opposed to comic book collection. I'm, um, I'm with the International Thriller Writers, which is an organization of thriller writers, and we do these, these projects that are partly charity things. Usually it, it supports Riff Reading is Fundamental, and what I'm doing is a serial graphic novel uh, where we'll have 15 writers, a, a nice balance of New York Times bestsellers and some up-and-coming writers. Each one will write 10 pages of the comic. It's one story, however. So each writer will go 10 pages and then dribble to the next guy in line. And um, I know so, uh, some of these guys very well, and I'm pretty sure they're going to try to screw the other guy pretty badly, like, you know, maybe killing all the characters off at the end of his 10 pages and saying, here, you, you're too much. Um, and my only requirement is they can't destroy the, the cars that the characters are driving. It's the one thing that you can't destroy by the end of the book. Characters, you know, who cares? But it has, at the end of the day, it does have to be one cohesive story. So 
I'll be doing a, a probably a fairly heavy edit on this as it goes along, especially as it gathers momentum. But it will be one story told by 15 people as a graphic novel. And I'm really looking forward to that process. Are you going to have different illustrators? We actually haven't gotten that far yet. Um, uh, I believe they're different. We're, we're, we're right now in the, in the phase of, of gathering uh, the, the, uh, uh, the writers. And we, we have 11 of the 15. Um, and once we have that, then the agent who's representing this project will take it to a publisher. And usually the publisher will have some say in the artists or artists who are involved. And it's probably not going to be a comic book company. So we may wind up with one or more artists through the project. Since none of us are getting paid, since the charity thing, uh, I doubt there's anyone's going to want to illustrate the entire thing. book for free. Right. So. I'm just curious, in your in your work on the comic series, are you assigned illustrators, or, or do you get to choose? I you no know, no say at all. I mean, they, they know which artists I, I, I would prefer to work with on certain projects, and they're like, oh, really? That's nice. Totally. <laughs> the editor usually matches uh, the artist to the project, and it's based on how much budget he has allotted for that project. A comic like Black Panther, which which sells decently, but does, is not an A-list character, doesn't have the budget for the, the top tier of artists. But there's a, there's a, an extremely talented tier a step down that are guys who are just about to make a break into the business. And you know, we, among those, he has to find the one that that's that's going to have the vision to to sell that that story. Uh, and they've been doing a great job so far. I have, I have not been disappointed with any of the artistic choices. I just found out that Scott Eaton is going to be uh, drawing the, uh, the Doom War comic, the uh, limited series, and I love his work. And I've, I've, all the guys that I've had so far really, really dig their stuff. So, not good, but I've been extremely lucky in the artistic choices, even though I had no, no say in them. Uh, Brian, do you want to touch briefly on your experience with seeking out collaborators and? And yeah, it's, uh, it's been kind of completely different from that. You know, I've mostly been reliant on, you know, some friends of mine who I've known for a long time. Who, like, you know, gone to art school or know somebody who knows somebody and, you know, kind of chasing down leads here and there. I've also used, um, you know, internet forums like uh, Pencil Jack, you know. Some people recommend like a particular DPNR account. Um, digital webbing has actually been pretty good for you know in terms of trying to track down people as well. So you've got that whole angle, and then there's the um, the con connection. You know, went to New York Comic Con, actually met a whole bunch of friends and you know people that I've tried to work with on particular projects just through you know, um, artists and uh, like writers connection panel that was there. And I also made a couple other connections going to a small press expo in Maryland. Also, you know, met a couple of people who were you know, uh, either established writers or you know established editors slash partners of the company that made different suggestions in terms of you know who to contact, who to get in touch with, where to look, that sort of thing. So it's been it's been interesting. And you know, obviously, I'm still looking. So we'll we'll see how that all comes out. Okay, now uh, let's move on to talk about uh, graphic novels and the teaching curriculum. Uh, Mary Beth, maybe you could start us off with this. How do you think graphic novels fit into the teaching curriculum? So, and and um, I'm sorry. How do they fit in the curriculum? Yeah, and, and uh, is is there a narrow place within the entire academic curriculum where they fit, or do you think that they can be? Applied across across the disciplines. Yeah. I, I know when we were batting around ideas about the panel, one of the questions was, uh, "Is the best fit in the humanities?" And I guess my initial reaction is yes. Um, you know, it's still it, it, in in higher ed. I mean, I know Dr. Hollis is, is teaching a, a, a whole you know course devoted to the, the graphic novel, but. I, I can only uh, speak from my own experience when it gets out to some of my colleagues that I'm teaching comic books, there is an immediate disdain. Um, and I think sometimes it just depends on how fiercely we uh, are attached to some of these books. Um, you know, I go back to, you know, speaking of reading as fundamental, um, the, the times that I have taught uh, Jimmy Corrigan and, and um, 
Alison Bechtel, and also a young woman named Kate Williamson, who, who's written a sweet little graphic memoir called At a Crossroads. She graduates from college and, and surprise, surprise, has to move home with mom and dad because she can't find a job. And um, it's, it's a pretty compelling um, little book. Every time I've taught a graphic novel here, I've been shocked that students often say, well, this is the first time I've read a graphic novel. Um, I, I made the assumption that they were a lot more uh, popular, I guess. Um, maybe it's just the Villanova crew, I don't know. But I do know that every time I've uh, taught them here, that students you know, come up to me the next semester and say, you, know, you totally got me hooked on the genre, and they've, they've discovered uh, favorite writers. And, and I'd like to hear from some of the, the students in the, in the um, crowd this evening, you know, how they, how they came to discover them, or did they sign up for the class because it sounded fun? Um, but I think, you know, they, they, do, they, they do belong in, in higher ed. I mean, I think Villanova maybe was coming late to the game having these, these offerings, because you look at a lot of, uh, you look at a lot of universities across the country, and, and uh, this offering has been on the books for, for a number of years. Um, not and not necessarily in an English department. Uh, you know, a lot of American Studies programs offer them, history programs, art, uh, but uh, mechanical engineering, I don't know. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have anything to say? I could add a word or two. I'm one of the ones Karen, that's Karen, teaching. Karen. Well, no, not. Karen uh, hi, Karen Hollis, and I'm uh, teaching a course Speaking in graphic the novels. Into and the um, okay, I uh, I've only had encouragement in the English department, and my colleague Hugh Ormsby Leonard is also teaching uh, graphic novels to movies, right? Course, and uh, it seems like the students are enjoying them, and uh, I think there's plenty of heavy duty stuff you can get into. I mean, first of all. All of the art and aesthetics and textual uh, elements that you can investigate with the ones that are longer and have some uh, deeper themes, perhaps. But then, of course, you can always study it as just uh, as part of cultural studies as a cultural phenomenon. And for example, like the Superman comics, what do they reveal about the American and the worldwide psyche since they have, they're spreading everywhere? And how you know we looked a little bit at how they changed from when they first came along, I think in the 30s, the Silver Age of uh, comics, and then the Golden Age of comics, and then today, and I mean, there have been huge changes um, in all kinds of ways, but just in the visual element, the first Superman was kind of, you know, he was a muscly guy, but my gosh, the ones nowadays, you know, with all of the um, technological developments in Photoshop, and I mean, they're just bulging out all over. <laughs> And uh, what does that say? And what's that? You know, just hundreds of things. The, the economics, the history of the times, the social zeitgeist, um, elder fascinating in windows into so much of our culture. So I think they're good in, in both ways as elements of art themselves, both on the textual and the artistic like, level, and then as uh, artifacts of cultural studies. And maybe Hugh wants to add a few words. I haven't drawn it yet. So well, it's coming up next right. yeah. spring. You probably have already filled it up, right? Fill the course? Yeah. It's not in my, I, I don't operate the computer. Oh, well, I'm sure I it has. I bet it has. Yeah. It has. Well, I'm doing Alan Moore, whom I like a lot. Um, a couple by him. And starting with Robert Crumb, whom I also like too. I mean, although whether he's a graphic novelist is another question, but he's a uh, sort of guy to the zeitgeist since the 60s, and the students don't know who he is if you mention the name Crumb, who, what. Um, one of the best documentaries ever made about, is about Crumb, I think, and I hope those will uh, complement each other well. Ghost World, um, American Splendor, um, Persepolis? Uh, well, I, I have a problem with both Persepolis and Mouse that I don't have anything to say about them because they are sort of so beautiful and self-explanatory that the art, it, well, this is a personal, personal problem. Um, <laughs> but History of Violence, which is a beautiful movie, I'm not sure about, but um, 
comic book, but it, I think will be the best movie in the class. I mean, Quay movie. Uh, the problem with movies from comic books is they're really about comic book characters and the mythology that surrounds that character, which is elaborated on screen, and it's not really a book into movie, it's an idea into movie, and one can say certain things about the ideas, um, all the things you mentioned, the zeitgeist, the social context, the musculature, the, you know, um, well, um, anyway, I mean, that's, I've said enough, so. Yes. Uh, I'll just add a word about uh, graphic novels versus comics. Um, you know, I really had no strong feeling one way or the other, but I have noticed that I tend, I was, well, when I made my assignments, the students in my class are writing graphic novels, but I, I have noticed that I have a hard time calling them graphic novels, mainly, ba mainly because of the length, not necessarily because of any other factor. But they don't have time, you know, over a semester to write to write what I think of as a novel, which would be a longer work, I don't know, 40, 50 pages at least, if not 100 or 200 or 300. So I guess I'm, I'm calling them comics just because I think of comics as a as a shorter art form. Mm -hmm. Oh, I will, I will say yeah. the uh, Modern Language Association is bringing out next month teaching graphic novels, 22 essays on teaching graphic so novels. There's, so there's your that's the rival and the uh, recent graphic sort of narrative about um, Bertrand Russell was reviewed very favorably both in the Financial Times and the New York Times without any condescension or, you know, um, isn't it weird we're reviewing this book? They just went ahead and reviewed it and discussed it and there was no, so um, read Mary Beth's comment, I mean, I think in terms of our culture, there are the cultural <coughs> critics who accepted the forum and, and are going with it, and we don't have apologies for making them more, so that's one comment there. All right, I have uh, uh, one more topic for us to discuss, and then I'd like to open it to, to the room for questions, uh, just so we don't run out of time for that. And uh, uh, this is about the, the future. I was talking to Brian briefly beforehand, and he mentioned that uh, someone had told him that he thought comics were going to die out because of technology, because of, of uh, digital technology such as uh, smartphones? Well, not so much die out, so much as um, be <coughs> shoveled almost exclusively that it was you know, the only way to go. And um, this, this person is a professor at Villanova, and he felt very strongly also because he feels very strongly about his smartphone. He feels that the smartphone is the greatest thing ever, greater than sliced bread, greater than the internet, greater than, I don't know, the bikini, anything. And um, he, he, you know, vehemently says, you know, it's all about the smartphone. It's about, you know, the iPhone, like the iPod, the iPhone, all that. And, you know, I, I personally disagree just because I felt, first off, that, you know, there will always be a place for people who would like to hold on to, you know, the physicality of media. That, you know, the comic book fans are generally people who like to collect things and, you know, have that kind of collection. And while you know, there's a large, large, increasingly, you know, large group of people with web comics and, you know, some love of the information, the consumption of information on the internet, they're still selling collections of them. They're still selling, you know, trade paperbacks filled with, you know, strips and everything like that. But, uh, did you... Well, the, the, question, the, the question that I have here is, where do you think graphic novels will go in the next 50 years? And I, I'd, uh, I'd like to encourage you to... to to tell me what you told me before we started about about uh, waiting for the next uh, person. Like as I was telling him earlier, why I think is coming is um, like we've seen some like you know the great kind of like you know cornerstones of you know graphic novels in terms of you know establishing it not as an art form but as kind of like legitimate form of expression. And I still think that we have yet to see something you know like truly massive, truly you know defining these kinds of like you know lighthouses of so, works saying this is the way that things will be in the future, something, you know, just not just the usual kind of like self-memoir type stuff, although, to be perfectly honest, I love Craig Thompson's blankets, I love Mouse, I love all those things, but I think, you know, what we're really waiting for is something that works within the graphic novel group medium and guidelines and whatever have you, and really just 
it goes past that. It expands beyond these limitations and says this is the sort of crazy, you know, expansive thing that we can do with the combination of the visual and the textual and really explore that space. You know, like um, when we had the kind of the um, just the changeover, the transition between oral and literary storytelling, you know, you have a lot of those same kinds of devices popping up within literary storytelling, and yet after a while, we as a culture, you know, past cultures, present cultures, future cultures, adapted to them and transformed them, and all of a sudden, you know, it reflects not only the society at large, but also just the medium itself, and I think that we're slowly starting to break those barriers of what we think graphic novels are supposed to be, and take them to where they should be. So in the next 50 years, I would really like to see the literary, the uh, graphic novel equivalent of, say, Crime Punishment or Don Quixote, something like that. It's really, you know, people will pick it up and regardless of what they say, this is a classic right here and this is something that, you know, is not a memoir, is not anything else. It is a work for graphic novels that could not have been done any other way. Uh, yeah, you know, the technology question is kind of interesting, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think too much about that. It's going to work out one way or another. I don't think books will be replaced completely. Some people still, some people watch movies on their little iPhones now. Uh, they dig that. That's cool. But there's still movie theaters and TVs and all that kind of stuff, you know. So um, I think that's going to play out however it's going to play out. But I think for 50 years, um, one of the things what's going to happen is kind of what's happening now is, is uh, like you said about the, the review of the Bertrand Russell thing, is people not even mentioning oh it's a graphic novel. It's just I think it's just going to become more of an accepted um, form. Uh, they'll just be books, you know. They're just stories, and uh, it's one way of telling a story. And um, I think there's room for all of the different kinds. There's the superhero stuff. There's the memoirs, um, novels like I'm doing or something like that. So. I just think it'll just be more of them, uh, and it won't be such a novelty to have a class in the uh, in university talking about them, as much as you know a novelty of a class on poetry is or something like that. You know? um, so I just think that's what's going to be. Yeah, I, I think um, over the next 50 years we're going to be seeing more and more graphic novels and comics in more areas of education. Uh, I think they, they are eventually going to replace a large portion of textbooks, probably in the earlier years. Um, I'm one of the kids that, you know, I, I really mastered a lot of, of learning um, from reading comics. The, the visual, you know, a lot of, so many people are visual learners, and to ignore that component is, is, is absurd. It's, it, 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 it's a disservice to the, 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 the group you're trying to educate. So if we can use the visual component to teach them language skills, uh, to teach them concepts, um, and, and with superhero comics, teach them ethics, because uh, there is a moral right and wrong in, in superhero comics. That, I think, is going to become a major component of education for the next 50 years. And it will be legitimized by, you know, to a great degree, by courses uh, where it is sort of the university level because there is a, a trickle-down um, validation or snobbery, depending on how you want to look at it, that if it's not accepted by uh, the, uh, the educated elite, then therefore it's not acceptable. It's not actually true, but, it, but we react that way. And the fact that, that we're allowed, you know, to, to teach it in college, fantastic. That's that's great. Way overdue. I mean, it, 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 they should have been teaching that back when uh, Greenland and Green Arrow was was doing a story about racism in America and, and drugs and and uh, the first Spider-Man comic came out, you know, dealing, dealing with drug addiction. That's when they should have been teaching this in, in college and, and weren't. So you know, we are actually behind the learning curve a little bit. Graphic novels, I think, are the bridge to catching up, and I'm glad to see what we've thought. Um, but also, I think the superhero comic is going to continue as the only form that will probably never go away in comics, uh, because it's, it is our oldest form of storytelling. If you look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Odyssey, I mean, come on, they're superhero tales. I'm, if you think they're straight reportage, <laughs> you have a, a serious dysfunction. Um, we, we, we tell tales of heroes, gods, and monsters because it, big picture helps with perspective. And superheroes, yes, all the guys look like they're Schwarzenegger in his heyday, and all the women look like Dolly Parton in Zero Gravity, but you know, it, it's still, you know, the visuals aside, 
the story is still there. We're getting we're getting the message across that good will eventually conquer evil, you know, or should conquer evil. Even it always it doesn't always in the comics. So I think that component is going to be with us. So education and uh, the the epic storytelling that that is fundamental to our way of thinking. Those things will will, will keep graphic novels alive 50 years and beyond. I'd like to, if I can just jump in on the chat, this is about education, I think that's true. We had like 20 years, at least, well, yeah, at least the last 20 years where you get all these articles about like, oh, comics are not for kids anymore. And now graphic novels, thanks a lot to uh, librarians really getting behind graphic novels for kids. And now you can go to the total section of a bookstore and there's tons of them, there's a lot of them. Uh, in 2005, I was trying to sell Storm in the Barn and I was at a publisher, one of my publishers, and the art director, the top art director, and we're just talking, and I kind of just said, yeah, I kind of have this idea for this graphic novel. And she's like, no, no way, we don't do them. Don't forget about it. No one's going to do it. Forget it. Just go to something else. And I said, wow, okay. And uh, she said, there's one guy that left here because we wouldn't do them. His name's Mark Siegel, and he started this little publisher called First Second. You might want to talk to him. Uh, Mark went on to build this fantastic imprint of graphic novels because that's exactly what he saw would happen. And then a year later, I was talking to my agent and I said, you know, I have to, I have to kick around this graphic novel idea. And she said, now is the time everyone starts saying, hey, you know, we want a bone too. You know, we want something else. So I kind of, it was very easy for me to sell my book because they were looking for it. And now you're seeing a lot more coming out that are for kids, which is great. And another um, thing that's going to come to that is you have this whole generation of kids that are growing up reading comics. Again, you know, and reading graphic novels for kids. My book is 10 and up, you know, so the idea was like a 10 year old can read it and, you know, I was 39, I read it for myself, you know. Um, but you're gonna have these kids that are it's not, you're not gonna have students 20 years from now or 18 years from now in college where you're gonna hand them a graphic novel and they've never seen one before. Because they've all read them, which is fantastic. And it's a great book, so, you know, they're already ahead of the curve. So that's definitely, uh, I totally agree with that. Okay, yeah, why don't we move on to take questions from the crowd. Over here. Um, okay. Hey, my name's Maria, and it's, it's so weird to me that so many people have, are familiar with graphic novels because I've been reading them for years, which comparatively isn't that long because I'm just 19. But <laughs> so, you know, I started off reading my dad's old comics, you know, Sunday comics, turned into Saturday morning cartoons, now they're these big feature films. And um, I had a question for you about um, about the Black Panther. I'm not very familiar with the character, but you said that you're going to be doing um, his sister. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. So yes. how do you plan on uh, on expressing this female voice, this black female voice, as well as putting in a little bit of your own? With that kind of well, uh, part, first of all, it's an ensemble coming right now because the, her brother's still in the story. She's he's the B story. She's the A story. Um, we're in the process of developing her as, as, a, as a character. She's gone through a transition. The last writer wrote her as a very arrogant, headstrong young woman, um, so much jealous of her brother's success, who then was forced into a position where she had to uh, sacrifice her life to save the country. She survived, but in the process, she also became the Black Panther. I stepped in at that point, and I'm writing her where she is running the country and also is, is she's, she's the, the prison's region of the country, She's also the superhero of the country. And she's putting on a very stern, outward face that we're going to, as time goes on, see crumble, but that she's faking it until she makes it. But right now, she's just trying to be the hero, be the princess. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting to explore that. Uh, I didn't want to go the route of, of having a, uh, another female lead who was highly emotionally charged. You know, I've, I've seen that since the 50s. So I wanted to show what a woman could be like when she's in her strength, and you know she's not she doesn't have any superpowers. She's just a very very powerful woman, and that's fun to write. I, I taught women self defense for over 20 years, so I'm, I'm used to powerful women. I have scars all over me from teaching that, <laughs> so I, I do know. Um, and I was raised. Um, my grandmother, who was the, the voice of reason in my family, was um, a very powerful woman, and I. I I've seen enough of them out there and know enough of them to, to, to respect what that power looks like. And it's not a woman acting like a man. She's not trying to imitate male power. It's female power. It's a different thing. And I'm, I will be exploring that during my run on Black Panther. And it's different nuances. Plus, bringing to the, 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 the account that she's also African. She's not African-American. She's African. <coughs> so she's 
she has the sensibility. She's of a privileged, wealthy family from a, from a technologically advanced nation. So that informs her sensibilities as well. She expects to win. Um, just the, the part of her that hasn't won yet is a little unsure. Anyone? Hi. Uh, I've actually grown up with graphic novels since I was about 12, and I had a teacher in high school who was very avid in teaching us from Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, James O'Barr's The Crow. Uh, and uh, I actually got 27 pages through a book in high school and then had this had scrap of the thing that's when I graduated. But um, as far as aesthetics is concerned, and, and this speaks to your education in academia, what is it that differentiates the graphic novel and graphic art in general from text? Um, and text is telling a story. Sequential art tells a story as well, but how does that qualify it as different from text, but also qualify it as art proper, something that evokes an emotional and a spiritual response from the reader, from the audience? Can I? Uh, one of the things uh, that, that it does is very similar to the way film does. It allows the, the, the reader or viewer to be a much more uh, active participant in the creative process of storytelling. In a novel, you tell them most, uh, even, even in literary novels that are allegorical, you're still largely telling them what you want them to think or how you want them to react. In the comic, you don't. You have the art there, you have the words, and you have the, the tone and shading, or if it was filmed, the lighting and the camera angle, to suggest the mood, but they really have to participate a lot in that creative storytelling. <laughs> If they're not willing to participate in that, they're not going to get anything out of the comic. And the, the people who, who really love comics are the ones who are who find that it, it allows them to, to really be a creative person, not just simply a passenger. And I, I think that's why comics really speak well. There are so many people who are creative who may not ex uh, know that about themselves, but they want that. It's, it's, what, they, it's what they need, and the comics allow that to, to blossom, allow, allow it to, to, to be very active. The other thing I would add is um, comics and text, as comics you have the visual, and speaking as an illustrator, uh, it's a little, it's it's like music, you know, music has a way to get people on an emotional level that nothing else does. And uh, art is sort of second, you know, it's it can also do that, you can have a picture of a character, and it may not even be saying anything, but if you're engaged in it, like Jonathan was saying, you're, you're really involved in it, it can speak volumes in a thousand words, kind of cliche. Uh, and that's, personal. that's where I think it goes into the, the realm of art, and it's the kind of storytelling that you don't get necessarily from a novel. Um, it's those moments where the art takes it into a different realm, and it really has a power to, to hit you emotionally, but I don't think anything else really does. Um, and I think that's the main difference. It's hard to describe, it's hard to, it's hard to do, you know, you can't, you sit there, you kind of want your drawing to, to have that effect. Uh, you know when it doesn't. <laughs> but it isn't sort of a thing where, like, well, I'll get this pencil for my emotional stuff. You know, it doesn't, you, you just kind of have to feel it internally. Um, it's kind of like being an actor, you know, you're watching a the movie, there's the lighting, all that stuff, help is going on. But it's usually the, the really good actors are able to just be part of the character and project what that character's thinking without even saying anything. It's sort of the same way with the drawings. I think of the wind in, in your book where all the, all the pictures have this sort of windy quality. Yeah, it's, uh, in my book it's, it's the dust bowl. So um, it's a lot of times it's covered in dust. And I also have a very, if you haven't seen my book, there's probably one around. I have a very sketchy style. There's some people draw uh, very realistically, very detailed. Uh, but I have a very loose, sketchy style. And with a dust bowl, I could even make it more loose. Uh, I was joking with somebody the other day, I don't think anybody has feet in my book, because that's what I do it. Um, but there's something about it. Dave McKean, who's a fantastic illustrator, did a lot of, he did all the Sandman covers. Uh, I read about I read an interview with him once, and he, he did a book called Arkham Asylum, which is a Batman book. Very dark, and it's sort of this technique that he has that uses Photoshop and photography. Beautiful, beautiful, dense work. Uh, but when he came to his own book, Cages, he, he started doing this much looser uh, brushwork where the characters have dot eyes and very, very simple, very, um, you know, <clears throat> just simple, uh, elegant drawing. Because he said with the Arkham Asylum stuff, because it was so detailed and so beautiful, it's, it affected the rhythm of the book. 
Because you look at those pictures and you're just like, wow. And you almost stop reading the book. So he found that um, a looser style helps you with your rhythm, which is one of the big things when you're writing and drawing and comic, you want to keep the rhythm going. Uh, so for my drawing, I kept it very uh, loose, very simple, because I think it helps the eye move through the story. Yeah, actually, uh, there was some criticism early on when a lot of artists broke away from uh, uh, Marvel to form image comics. Uh, there was a lot of criticism that the art was, was so complex, so dense, so overdrawn that you lost the story entirely. Um, it, it actually became uh, barbed wire to keep the reader from participating at all. Yeah. Um, so the, the simpler storytelling style works in a lot of, and some of it's stuff in, in the better comics, there may be actually more in there than you think, but on the first pass, you're getting a gut reaction to it. And that's what the really good artists are looking for. They want that, that, that subliminal bang of a reaction. And you and the, and the writer and the artist are all there together in that moment. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Mike Razor. I want to talk to like what I, a pattern that I've known in the last com few years of comics that I've been reading. Well, um, initially, from what I gather, comics started out like these superheroes, godlike powers, where they, it was black and white, good and evil. And I've noticed a trend where it goes more like to a human, softer feel, where the gods are able to make mistakes, they're able to bleed, love, have background, complex, layered stories. Um, what do you see the trend going next? Like, uh, um, it went from good versus evil to we're now in the middle of this together. <laughs> I'm part of you. I'm helping you. What's the next step for comics? Yeah. I uh, I see what you're talking about. Um, it kind of reminds me. I did a project this past year on uh, Ed Brubaker's Captain America, and you know you got that one classic. In the you know, recent Captain America storyline, where you know Captain America gets shot, that kind of ultimate transition between you know deity and mortality. It's personally, what I think is going to be happening in you know, the next kind of couple of years, and this is something that I saw in you know All Star Superman, which is on the table over there, awesome stuff if you haven't read it, is kind of you know a transition between you know this kind of like dredged down in human mortality and everything to kind of heroes being inspirational again. And where you say, you know, it's kind of like a recent thing, oh, that people have been rushed down this kind of the instructionist superhero stuff where everything is all about, you know, their everyday lives. And if you look back at the original Spider-Man, things like that, or even my favorite Daredevil, you know, they've always been kind of mired in this, you know, very human type of thing, but it's also part of the character, you know, where Superman isn't necessarily tied down by, you know, his mortality, he's pretending to be mortal, you've got people who can't escape it, like, you know, Peter Parker can't escape being a student and teenager and, you know, a guy who just can't get date and until, you know, recently when he was married and then, you know, then back to being a guy who can't get a date again thanks to Joe Quesada, but, um, you know, there are, I think, you know, it's going to go, you know, kind of, a little bit back to the you know the shining black and white parables, but not so much. I think it'll be more clearly defined. You're going to see more heroes kind of back to inspire again. I think that's really where it's going to be going, and that you'll have that kind of human element, but it'll be kind of like more of a paragon of you know humanity that you know is achievable rather than something that's you know above and beyond you know, like a superman type thing. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, in, in large parts of that, uh, we, we, we saw the fractured hero. You know, they, they became more complex. They explored the dark side of the heroes quite a bit. Um, then, when we had our economic crash of the last uh, year or so, and we saw so many of the people and institutions that we were supposed to place our trust in fail, uh, it, the, the crumbling of, of the trust is going to be is being echoed in the comics, where characters who had had fallen or had not been uh, proven to be trustworthy, I think we're going to see a, a move toward uh, kind of a reclamation of the soul. I hate to use the word redemption, but it's that kind of a concept where a character who has failed the people that he or she is supposed to be protecting is going to work toward rebuilding that trust. And I, I'm seeing some trends now in, in some comics where, where they're doing that. I'm certainly working on that in one of my projects, um, where a character who has failed is now realizing the, the cost of you know his mistakes. It's not just you know something that didn't work out for him, it's damage to others. And you know, can can we fix that? So I think that's one element, that's one pillar of this. 
and the other will be some characters that are simply going to be moving toward um, they're really good guys and they're not bad guys, so it is going to be that strong. <laughs> I don't think they'll go too far with that because there's always the danger of the Superman character. When, when Superman was first created, you know, he was cool, and then very quickly he became boring because nothing could hurt the guy. Um, I mean, really, if, if you're going to live forever, you're invulnerable. I mean, come on, where's the, where's the tension? They gave, they, they invented kryptonite, put that, in, which was I think a radio in the radio shows first before it was in the comic, to give him some some vulnerability. In the, in the the comics movies, you always see that the hero loses his costume, his armor, or something to bring him back to the human element. Um, because the human is what we need to relate to. But if but there's a danger of making the character too human because then they're not that god or champion status. So we're working on finding the really great role model that we can have as a superhero that is a really good guy, but is also accessible. Um, that's that's the golden challenge right now. And that's that's the golden place right now. We need that to do. And and I think a lot of writers are writing in that direction right now. To, to have a character that is, is truly admirable, yet believable. And um, if any of you have a great idea for that, you know, pitch it to your local comic company. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I have two more. I'm sorry. I'm talking too much. Um, so I just remembered uh, Marvel was bought out by Disney not that long ago. Have you seen that effect? I was immediately upset because I don't want to see like, the characters that we've grown to love. As someone said in class, you know, what is Iron Man without being an alcoholic, like that all plays into their background, into their lifestyle. So uh, we're all kind of afraid to see Disney begin to water down the stories of these characters. Have you, has that affected? Never going to happen. <laughs> Disney, owned, uh, Disney bought Marvel. They are not going to run Marvel. Um, they, they kept the creative teams, the editors in place. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but what they're saying is do what you're doing. It's just don't worry about paying the bills because they're always going to pay now because pay for Disney. Um, it's going to deepen Marvel's pockets, it's going to keep them secure, but they are, they're not going to mess with that, that plan. You know, we have, you know, as the writers, we have not been told that we have to, um, you know, get uh, Wolverine to watch his language or stop killing people. Or stop smoking. Or stop. Actually, nobody in Marvel smokes anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was before Disney. But what about Wolverine and the Stogies? That's so how, that's how, when's the last time you saw the smoking Stogies? Um, probably in the movie. Yeah. Um, yeah Marvel true. characters don't smoke. Um, but uh, this Disney is is just solidifying it. Remember, it wasn't that long ago that Marvel was you know filing for bankruptcy. Um, so you know it got saved by some clever management and by the presence of the Marvel movies. The Blade movies kicked that process off, and now Disney comes in and just says, all right, well you're you know you're not only on safe ground, you're in the middle of a stable continent. You know, just do what you got to do. Um, my second question kind of open to everybody. Um, I'm. I I've been an artist ever since I could hold a pencil, uh, like writing too. Um, sort of what advice do you have for artists and writers to get to the next level? Um, Brian, we were on the train and he was yeah. teaching me some methods to sort of, I have a hard time sort of getting past the perfectionist stage and just constructing the story, constructing the characters. I went through some basic techniques, but uh, just what advice do you have? Portfolio. It's, a, it's all about your portfolio. So work really hard to put together a good portfolio because it's the most important thing that will get you a job and it's the only thing that you have any real control over. There's some luck, there's like getting the right person at the right time, and the right day, and they're in the mood. But the only thing that you really can completely control is your portfolio. And when I was putting my portfolio together, I spent like three or four years, and I kept throwing stuff out, like the perfectionist thing, I totally hear you with this. Uh, but you got to get to a point where you stop, and you get 12 pieces that are really good, and then you put them in front of somebody who can actually hire you. It's, there's a lot of people kind of think, come into these things thinking, well, what's the magical thing? Where am I going to get the magic? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's a business. It's real. People can get this job. It's a real job. Uh, it's not like you have to find the rainbow and get there. It's You have to have a good portfolio and get it in front of the people who can hire you. Uh, but as an artist, that's what you should concentrate on. You don't have to worry about doing a whole comic book. You don't have to, you know, 12 pieces that are really good with a variety uh, that shows you can do it. Show people because they want to see you can show people, draw people. Uh, if you want to look at children's thing, draw like a couple bunnies, whatever. Um, if you want superheroes, draw Spider Man, stuff like that. Um, very simple. Uh, concentrate on that. Yes, 
Um, I just have a quick question about the nature of uh, the illustrators and the author working together. Um, what sort of, sorry, the illustrators and the writer, but what sort of disagreements arise between the two? And um, how is this kind of process structured so as to prevent that? Just, I mean, like creative, I feel like it's prone to that. Well, the editor gets to be the bad guy all the time. So if the writer doesn't like the pencils, he tells the editor, and the editor will send a note to the artist, usually um, worded as if it's coming from the editor, even though he may cut and paste from your email. And so the editor gets to be the bad guy and say, you know, this visual's not working, and same the other, other way. Um, very rarely are there, are there major uh, collisions, however, because before it even gets, the, the script even gets to the artist, the editor goes through it and makes decisions on whether you know it fits the sort of style, whether it, it fits good visual storytelling, and so on. So the editor filters a lot of this out. He, he, he troubleshoots it before it's a problem. And if there's a if there is a problem, everyone goes to the editor. You never, at least in the Marvel way, the writer and the artist do not clash. Uh, everything is is structured to prevent any kind of clash between the two of them. And there have been some disagreements. I know there are some writers and artists who have some, have some problems. Uh, when that does happen, we're also encouraged to keep it out of the public. Uh, some people go on message forums, and they ought to be shot. Um, but usually, if, if there's if there's a creative difference, it's probably a good idea to, to at least listen to what the other side has to say. I had a, a panel in uh, one of my very first comics where I had described something very precisely what I wanted, and the artist came back with a, an alternate suggestion that was a completely different panel. And you know, my first reaction is, wait a minute, that's not what I, what I wanted. But then I read the pages up to that point and said, okay, well, clearly he's seeing the visual going in a different direction. He, he took it out of, you know, it was in a room, he took it outside, he had a different backdrop and everything else. And I'm thinking, does it tell the story I want to tell? And I, uh, my thought was, it could, if I change a little bit of the caption, it will not only tell the story I want to tell, it will make a stronger ending to it. So I was willing to yield to what would have been a slam bang final panel from his, as opposed to what would have been a good final panel if he had drawn it the way I said. So I, I yielded to his visual sense. And there are times artists have made suggestions and I've mixed them because it, it doesn't suit the story. Usually it's, since everything is done at the pencil stage, it isn't heavily done, um, it, changes can be made. And it, it, it rarely gets to hard, hard feelings. Uh, yeah, yeah, that has in the professional realm, there's always the editor in between. Uh, and the other things, like you're saying, everyone is trying to just make the best book they can make. So when someone does suggest something that's not your original thought, you do say, well, let me take a look at this, because they're not just saying, well, I think it should be this, because I want to draw it. You know, they're saying, you know, I think this will make the book better. No one's trying to sabotage, so, it's, so it keeps conflict out of it. Yeah, and actually, one other real quick thing. Um, one of the things I did when, when this artist People come to me with, with, the, with the suggestions. I, I signed on to Marvel Digital Comics, which has thousands of comics that you can actually look at on your computer, and scan them all in. And I looked at his art. I looked at the way he handled uh, stories from other writers, and it gave you know I got a sense of who he was. So it was a lot more, uh, a lot easier choice for me to 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 make that change than to resist it because I, I, I saw what it looks like when he really fires his best. If he's that passionate about that image, then he's, you know, I, I gotta respect that, that degree of enthusiasm and it turned out to be the right thing. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more. Anybody? Quick one, quick one. Uh -huh. uh, among the artist team in a big outfit like Marvel, is the penciler considered kind of, does he have more, or she have more prestige? It seems like, yeah, they would, because that's where it all begins, right? And then they have the inker, and then the colorer, and the... Yeah, I mean, when we refer to the artist on the comic, usually we refer to the penciler. Uh, though there are so many inkers who, can, who, who do so much for a comic. Um, I've met a few recently who uh, just are amazing. And I, I, in thinking back, there was a comic, um, Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos, war comic back in the, in the 70s and 60s. Um, there was a, Dick Ayers was drawing the comic, penciling it. But when Marie Severin inked it, it became ten times better. So she she upped the art on that considerably as an inker. Um, we also have colorists now who are using computer coloring that 
that just do amazing things. But usually when we talk about the artist, it is, it is the artist who actually does the pencils. And it's quite a few of them also do their own inks. I'm working with a guy now for a Punisher Unlimited series. He does uh, his own inks. And um, I just got some pages on it, and they're amazing. So. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, maybe one more? Go ahead. Uh, I have a question, sort of comment, about maybe graphic novels and, and stepping forward. Um, I had done uh, some research. Actually, this was in like high school, and wrote letters. And got responses, actually, to Peter David, Neil Gaiman, Ray Bradbury. So that was a huge thing as being like a little fanboy. But one thing that stuck with me that um, Ray Bradbury said, and actually someone was speaking about Alan Moore, too, I think he kind of echoed this. When he wrote me a letter, he said that he saw uh, graphic novels and comic books as like the next logical step in storytelling. And kind of broke it down saying from, like you spoke uh, about earlier, about the, um, you know, telling stories around campfire to writing and he said he thinks that people are almost so, sort of desensitized to text and reading novels. They need something different, like a big shake up and he kind of that so I mean that was neat and then I kinda of saw uh, something I, I when all the Watchman stuff was coming around, I know Alan Moore distanced himself from that. But Alan Moore kinda of said that it was more fun to do comics than write novels. Because it, the, the because of the interaction, if you're speaking of, it's more of a uh, more medium. Um, so the question would be, based on that and, and seeing how graphic novels are, are really coming to the forefront in education, um, I guess. Sorry, sorry, I'm gonna run at this. The is is like where what what can we do more? Um, to get the graphic novels, I mean, I get that. I think that because they're in, in education, they are they're starting to get more um, acclaim. But where, how can we, as as people enjoy it, and you as artists, like get them more acclaim in the forefront? And I, I think the reviews are doing that. But where can we? Where's the next step for us? I mean, we, you guys are, are writing it, but where can we help? Um, Sorry. Well, I don't think the comics are ever going to replace um, prose, but they shouldn't. Uh, you know, it's a weird thing. It's just the, uh, it's a combination of people saying, I'm open to reading a graphic novel and having graphic novels that are, that are good, that someone reads and says, yeah, I love that. And not, oh, well, I appreciated that the form. You know, you want someone to just read and say, God, that's a great book. Um, so I think it's going to be more organic. Thing. Um, I would encourage uh, everyone here um, to explore our holdings here in the library, and um, please feel free to... Uh, make collection suggestions. We have, um, a couple of months ago, there was a, uh, a, a feedback column on our blog about graphic novels, in, inviting comments and suggestions. And uh, feel free to look for that. And uh, you can take an active part in developing our collection here and what we have available. Maybe we'll do something like it again in the future.